Hello and good evening, good afternoon to everyone who is here. Thank you very much for joining us for this really important Congress on long COVID. At the moment, there's probably no bigger challenge that the world is going to face because even with the pandemic apparently settling, there are so many across the world who are affected by long COVID. One of the most important things that we have to do is break the stigma. A lot of people are suffering with symptoms, but they don't feel comfortable to share it. And part of what we'll be doing is trying to bring the science and bring the, the right approach to how we can manage long COVID. It's a tremendous honor for me to have with me such a diverse group from across the world to share ideas and concepts about long COVID. And we're breaking everything up into very short speaker segments, um, 10 minutes each, and then each speaker will be able to speak with the panelists. We have three panelists who will all introduce themselves. And so we have two sections where we have three speakers first, and then in the second section, we have two speakers. Sadly, one of our speakers was not well today, so was unable to join us, but hopefully I'll be able to catch her in the future and explore a bit more about what she's thinking. Now, the most important thing is that towards the end of the conference, at about the two hour mark, we will formally close, but there is a good possibility that the conversation will continue. And if you are interested in hearing some more as the speakers and panelists share ideas and thoughts, certainly stay with us for the duration. So the first thing is to bring everyone in and I'll ask all of our speakers and panelists to do a quick introduction before we do our first spotlight. So thank you everyone for being here with us. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just ask each person to do a very, very quick introduction of themselves. And I'll probably start with you, Shankara, since you're, you're closest to me on the left. Um, just for 10, 20 seconds, say who you are. And you're muted at the moment, Shankara. So just unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hi, uh, hi to everyone. Uh, nice having uh, stage to, to explore this topic. I'm Dr. Shankara Cherry. I'm a GP and a natural science biologist from South Africa. I've been a frontline doctor for the past two years treating COVID patients. And I hope to bring some new insight and information in moving forward and treating long COVID. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, Valentina? Hello, welcome to this nice event, everyone. And my name is Dr. Valentina Viduta, and I am founder of Long COVID-19 Foundation Registered Charity in the UK. I am a panelist here today, and I will be helping everyone to learn more on your symptoms. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Valentina. And uh, Jess? Uh, hi there. Um, to people who don't know me, I'm a patient advocate for long COVID, and I've done a number of my own patient-led studies, uh, which I publish on my YouTube channel, along with uh, various interviews with experts and different specialisms that are applicable to trying to understand the condition. Uh, and I'm one of the panellists today. Wonderful. Thank you, Jez. And uh, Tina? Hello, um, welcome to this Congress. It's very exciting to be speaking today. Um, I have a history, I'm a doctor in the UK and I have a history of last six, seven years of treating patients with mast cell activation syndrome. And that developed because I've lived with a patient with mast cell activation syndrome all my life. My youngest daughter has it. And uh, so I know the challenges of somebody who has these symptoms. And I recognize that the long COVID patients have the same symptoms. So I'm going to be talking about how my approach to treatment. Wonderful. Thank you. And Manan, are you muted at the moment, Manan? So welcome to the channel and the Congress, you know, we guys uh, will discuss and let you know about uh, perspective in our discipline. I am a neuroscientist at Baal Khan University, Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, we, when the pandemic started, uh, we published more on the neuro aspect of the COVID. So you will hear me talking about the neuro COVID uh, in long COVID patient and symptoms and signs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Bruce? <clears throat> Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Dr. Bruce Patterson. I'm a viral pathologist, uh, formerly of Northwestern and then Stanford University in the United States. Um, I'm the CEO of Incel DX, which has developed uh, a comprehensive process um, uh, from diagnosis with precision 
AI driven diagnostics all the way through telemedicine, um, you know, wearables and um, medications. And um, we do that all through the chronic COVID treatment center that was founded by myself, Ram Yogendra and Kirby Parrott. So I'm pleased to be here. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Resia, you're muted at the moment. Hello everyone, I'm Risha Pretorius. I'm from Stanamosh University and I do research looking into platelet activation, hyperactivation, clotting pathologies and how they interact with the vasculature to cause the persistent symptoms in long COVID. Excellent. And um, uh, we've got as well, Joachim. Yeah, um, my name is Joachim Gerlich and I'm a shareholder and co-founder and head of product development with with Vedicinos Biotech India. I'm German myself and spent the last decade uh, researching chronic illnesses and uh, the connection to micronutrition and spent a, a lot of, spent a lot of time and resources on setting up organic farming and nutraceutical developments. And uh, we have been working the last two years on uh, nutraceutical interventions uh, for COVID and long COVID conditions. Excellent. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for that quick introduction. And uh, what I'll be doing first in our first section is that we're going to first have a spotlight where we're going to get some ideas and thoughts um, from Valentina. And she is one of our panelists and she'll be sharing the experience of many of the people who I guess are part of the Long COVID charity. So for our first spotlight, Valentina, do you mind sharing some thoughts with us? Absolutely. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So hello everyone and welcome to this Long COVID Solutions Congress. I'm Valentina Viduta, founder of Long COVID Foundation, a UK registered charity. Our mission is to help people to avoid Long COVID syndrome and improve well-being of sufferers by increasing awareness, generating and sharing educational resources and supporting the innovative solutions and research for recovery taking place worldwide. I'm pleased to take part in such an important event where world-class leaders, scientists, and doctors can share their findings relevant to long COVID. More than 40% of COVID-19 survivors across the world have or had long-term effects after recovering, according to a new study by researchers at the University of Michigan. Based on the number of infections reported globally by mid-October last year, that means more than 100 million people have expressed lingering health concerns or are still reporting problems following a COVID infection. The most common symptoms was fatigue, which affected about 23% of people with lingering issues. Other symptoms such as shortness of breath, insomnia, joint pain and memory problems were reported by 13% of people. What's more critical, some COVID survivors may develop other severe complications and conditions, such as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, and chronic fatigue syndrome. In the past year, we were searching for expertise closely related to post-viral conditions, autoimmune diseases, neurology, cardiology, pulmonology, and rheumatology. We have produced a series of educational videos which tackle the viral damage from a single perspective. However, with time, we noticed that long COVID cannot be attributed to something specific known so far. And research findings more and more talk about long COVID as a novel disease that needs to be looked at from multiple pathways. And I believe all Long COVID community members who will be watching this event today would love to learn more from today's speakers on the following. What are the Long COVID pathways and biomarkers we need to consider while diagnosing Long COVID? What are the right tests that people can do to identify Long COVID? And what are the solutions? approved or alternative that can ease the suffering and improve well-being. 
I look forward to learn more and I will help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Valentina. This is a great way for us to uh, start the conference. And so the first thing that we're going to be doing is that we are going to be starting with our first uh, speaker. And um, we'll first start with Professor Rezia Pretorius from South Africa. And um, we'll be sharing her screen with us in just a second. Kindly welcome Kindly our welcome. next speaker. Our So, okay, um, I'll add this straight to the screen, Arezia, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello again, everyone. Today I will be sharing with you our latest research on clotting pathologies and will spotlight our recent findings in COVID-19 and long COVID. I wish to just uh, share with you my research collaborators, Professor Douglas Cowell, he's from the University of Liverpool and a systems biologist, Clinician Dr. Jakub Lopsche from the Mediclinic Stellenbosch, Hematologist Dr. Jan Mistienkamp from Pathcare in South Africa, Dr. Marie Fluck, who is a biochemist and also at our proteomics lab, Dr. Chantal Finter, she's a physiologist, and our team of uh, data scientists from the School of Data Science and Computational Thinking at Stellenbosch University. We have ethical clearance for the studies and Midi Clinic Private Hospital Group approved sample collection at their facilities. My lab and our collaborators from various labs over the world have been identifying inflammatory molecules in circulation that might be involved in and drive pathological clotting. And we have also focused our research endeavors on studying the effects of increased circulating inflammatory molecules and how they interact with cells of the hematological system. We focus in particular on platelets and red blood cells, as well as on the clotting protein fibrinogen. We are also interested in identifying novel inflammatory molecules that might play a role in the persistent symptoms of long COVID. I'm also interested in platelet signaling and the role in abnormal clotting. Platelets in circulation play a critical role in healthy clotting However, they can become overstimulated and can drive pathological blood clotting if there are inflammatory molecules in circulation. This can also happen in the presence of viral infections where platelets can act as important signaling entities. There is also a complex relationship between receptors on platelets and endothelial cells where circulating biomarkers may bind to. As we now know, damaged endothelial cells and platelet hyperactivation are central pathologies in acute COVID and long COVID. Our research group has therefore shown these pathologies in acute COVID in numerous published papers. Early in 2021, we turned our attention to long COVID. We looked at blood samples from patients and soon realized that there are persistent microclots and widespread endothelial dysfunction and microclots interactions with platelets as well in these patients. These pathologies may be central in causing the widespread symptoms in these patients and may lead to tissue hypoxia. Here are examples of platelets in healthy individuals on the micrographs on the left. And in the micrographs on the right, you see platelet hyperactivation and significant clumping in patients with long COVID. We also plan an experiment where we looked at proteomics of healthy plasma versus type 2 diabetes, acute COVID-19 and long COVID. We added diabetes samples as we know that patients suffering from diabetes are more prone to severe COVID-19 symptoms. For proteomics analysis, we prepared platelet-poor plasma from citrated blood, followed by a first digestion step. To our surprise, we found a visible deposit at the bottom of the tube in the acute COVID and long COVID samples, but not in the diabetes samples and also not in the control samples. Plasma proteins, therefore, were fully digested in controls and diabetes samples, suggesting that trypsin could digest all or then at least most of the plasma proteins in both controls and health and diabetes samples. We also followed a second trypsin digestion protocol to solubilize the undigested pellet deposit. 
We analyzed one micrograde protein of the supernatant and also the equivalent from the digested pellet deposit. When we viewed the unfiltered supernatant after the first trypsinization digestion step using fluorescence microscopy, we saw that microclots were still present in the samples, and here are examples of those. And these are non COVID patients after the first digestion step. The lack of breakdown of these clots may have significant clinical value. Here is a simplified diagram to explain clot formation and then also breakdown during acute COVID. During acute COVID, spike protein induces microclots that are more resistant to clot breakdown. In some individuals, during the recovery process, healthy fibrinolysis or clot breakdown will happen, as it should and individuals who will return to full health. However, in some individuals, and as just mentioned, between 10, 30, and even 40% of a healthy in the, of individuals that developed uh, acute COVID will not uh, return to health. And therefore, their healthy fibrinolysis ly 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 system will not happen. A lack of breakdown or fibrinolysis in long COVID patients may result in persistent failed fibrinolytic systems. Our proteomics results also found numerous inflammatory molecules that were trapped in the microclots and of particular interest is alpha-2 antiplasmin. This molecule prevents clot breakdown. I wish to also return your attention now to the latest US government document where microclot presence viral persistence and autoantibodies were recognized as central pathologies to look into finding answers for long COVID treatments and diagnosis. I wish to also end this presentation with an urgent call for trials to investigate treatment options, also to treat clotting abnormalities. These trials are desperately needed for our long COVID population. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Razia. And what we'll be doing is that we will be in the panel discussion. We will then have a little bit more questions from the panelists to explore those fascinating concepts a little bit more. And so straight away, moving right along, um, we're going to have Joachim um, Jorlash from Vedicinals. I'll ask you to unmute your mic um, for us, uh, Joachim. And um, we'll ask you to go ahead with your presentation. I'm just going to bring it up here for you. Okay, um, thank you, go ahead. Yes, good evening. I hope uh, that the connection is better now. We had some trouble here technically. And uh, yes, so to, um, I'm here tonight to make a case for nutraceutical interventions and dietary supplements and how they can come into play to rebalance and uh, restore certain um, parameters in the long hauler conditions. Um, to give you a brief uh, overview of our, our project, Vedisnus India is a, a German India biotech company uh, established in uh, early 2020 as to provide the framework for all that. And um, what we did is we concentrated on uh, natural molecules because they have certain properties that we uh, very, very, um, very experienced in in the last decade. Uh, so what we did is, um, starting in uh, early 2020, we had uh, 25 expert teams that worked now for almost uh, two or more than two years uh, on meta-analysis, AI-supported research, preclinical trials, toxicity trials, formulation development, pharmacokinetics, bioavailability studies, computational analysis and modeling, and then leading to clinical trials in a phase two human clinical trial and all the necessary compliance and quality control up to manufacturing and logistics. What we did is, and please go to the uh, next slide, uh, thank you. What we did is we, we combined uh, the most comprehensive and um, potent molecules against many COVID conditions. And if you go to the next slide, I can explain how we got to this mix of nine molecules. So in the beginning, we were uh, looking at, um, uh, at more or less 8,000 natural molecules available to um, that are known that are known there's enough lit literature and evidence uh, that, are, that can be used to correct um, any kind of or many different uh, um, conditions. So out of these 8,000 molecules, we ran like uh, close to 100 pathways 
uh, with computational ana analysis to look at uh, the, the most potent, comprehensive, and synergistically, uh, synergistically working uh, molecules. As you can see on this, is one example where these single molecules have been reported and later on in our own trials in combination as to be able to help the organism to rebalance itself and even restore organ functions and organ tissues. If we go to the next slide, I can show you now what happened in our phase two clinical trials with 124 patients. And uh, that was even coming in for all the experts as a surprise that we could um, prove with, uh, with the um, percentage of abnormal lung findings. So in our cohort that was 62 patients, we were starting off with the abnormal uh, lung uh, x-ray findings in the, um, almost 95%. And we could reduce that in 12 days significantly, as you can see in this statistics. And by day 45 in these clinical trials, we had uh, a, almost a complete uh, um, clearing of these findings. And so this is a, a pretty hard evidence on how well these molecules can support the organism in regaining um, lung function, for example. That's one of, one of many examples. So our clinical examples. So our clinical trials was uh, set for acute COVID um, in combination with uh, traditional allopathic pharmaceutical treatment interventions. And it was two groups. One had a standard treatment um, protocol, like in India, that is not bad. It's, um, uh, including ivermectin, uh, corticosteroids, antibiotics, and mm, several other medications. And we were given as an adjuvant treatment, and we could significantly improve the outcome of the patients um, with our nutraceutical intervention. If we go to the next slide, you will see more examples of clinical observations in the 62 patients that were on our intervention protocol. Um, the clinical observation for fatigue, hypoxia, like low blood oxygen level, sore throat, and myalgia, as you can see, were reduced uh, significantly in the uh, time it takes uh, for allaying the symptoms in days of treatment. So that was uh, giving us a lot of um, uh, momentum in order to say, okay, let us continue all this. And um, we went into many parallel trials in uh, different directions, also including animal trials to see how far can we work on cytokines, how, how do we work on different enzyme expressions, on blood clotting, uh, on organ damage parameters. And if you go to the next slide, I can show you some interesting results there as well. Uh, so we did, um, even before the, we went to human clinical trials, we, we were conducting um, preclinical animal trials, and uh, that was an in, um, artificially induced myocardial infarction. And you can see on the troponin level, that was uh, reduced uh, even by orders of magnitude with the nutraceutical intervention. And the best, uh, most interesting, of course, is that we can see then after the trials, we could take um, biopsies from the heart tissue, which you see on the right, and the upper one is untreated. And the bottom one is treated with, uh, not treated, but had, we had a, a nutraceutical intervention with our nine molecules in this suspension. And so these are all, um, I cannot show in this short time of 10 minutes now all the results that were um, occurring. But if we go now to the next slide, you can see that our main focus was not to prove that these molecules can be beneficial that is pretty known. The biggest problem with these molecules is to have them in the, at, a, um, at a sufficient bioavailability. And here we have one example, one of many, where it's pretty drastic. You can see that these, you can see three columns here. The, the yellow one on the left is untreated animals. The one in the middle is, is as if you would take normal capsule nutraceutical, you would buy the nine ingredients and take them as a powder. And you see there was a reduction in G GPT, which is mainly a marker for liver uh, damage. But when you go to the right column on the blue one, you see that when we used our final version of Fidismus 9 with a very uh, specific formulation development being done to it, we could increase the bioavailability by uh, quite an impressive factor. So the, the results speak for itself. It's almost a 20-fold 21 or let's say around 20 fold increase in bioavailability on that marker. Interesting to say is that these uh, molecules and this suspension has proven that it does not forcefully regulate these things. 
it balances them, it rebalances. We had a, um, yesterday I got a call uh, from a medic in, in the UK and he gave me clearance also to report on what he did. So after 10 days of treatment or intaking of Vedicinus 9, his blood pressure went down significantly. He was on constantly very high blood pressure, 170 to, correct me if I'm wrong, to 110 or something. And it went back to quite normal levels within a week and but not causing vasodilation. So when he when he would stand up, he wouldn't get an increased heartbeat or anything. So it seems these molecules help the organism to come back to uh, this homeostasis state in many different functions. And so it can be a, a very good idea to um, to look at these nutraceutical interventions, not only what we have, also uh, combinations with other nutraceuticals, vitamins, vitamin D3, zinc, and others. Plus, we are working on a car a currently on refining the treatment so that it, it even works better. And this can be forming the basis for um, for a evaluated kind of treatment plan because we can also, we are currently also conducting some um, uh, serum marker uh, evaluations with patients to really see before and after what has changed, what has been improving. And uh, as there are so many symptoms and so many different conditions and pathways, we are documenting more than 100 single drug target pathways at the moment. I think that a broadband comprehensive nutraceutical intervention can support any, um, let's say, normal treatment plan and protocol um, in the long haul of treatment. And uh, yeah, that is uh, maybe can we can go one more one more slide. Do I have do I have a minute more? Then the next question, of course, is what about safety? What about um, and let's say the adverse events during the clinical trial? There you can see there were no adverse events at all in our group. In the normal standard treatment group, there was a headache. That was all. That was a 14-day trial with a uh, high, high daily um, dosage intake of the patients, and uh, there was nothing reported. Before, of course, we went into clinical trials. We went into uh, many, many different animal trials, and as you can see there, the acute toxicity study was classifying us as a um, um, as a category five nutraceutical with an LD50 of 5,000 milligram per kilo of body weight. So that would mean it is that is 60 times the dosage we are using at the moment. And um, yeah, so this is what we have uh, in a very, very short <laughs> version, what we have been doing in the last two years. And I don't want to get too much into technical details and pathway charts and descriptions, but I'm open for questions later on. And uh, I hope that this can give you an overview more or less in which direction we are going. The, um, the product is available globally and being used already by many thousand people with great success. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Joachim. And that's something, again, that we will certainly get the, uh, the panel to discuss in a little bit more detail. And I really appreciate that. And uh, what we'll do is move straight along to our next speaker, which is Dr. Manan Beg. And um, I'll bring up your slides straight away and uh, we'll get you to uh, be able to um, discuss this. Thank you very much. And uh, I start with this slide that shows my collaborators, my faculty and research assistants, even medical students who came involved in the projects that I do here at Al Khan University, Pakistan. Now, uh, the next slide uh, will show you that neurological, uh, if you could change it to the next one, yeah, neurological damages caused by SARS-CoV-2 in COVID and long COVID has long been a neglected aspect and it, it was denied initially a lot uh, that, that uh, we didn't see these many cases in SARS-CoV-1, okay, so why SARS-CoV-2 is attacking the neurological tissue. So by this time when I'm presenting this slide, that issue for, uh, luckily and fortunately got uh, like uh, addressed now because uh, Top journals, peer-reviewed journals now have published over 6,000 uh, papers on, on uh, neurological damages caused by SARS-CoV-2 in COVID. Million dollar question, is it being uh, taken into the long COVID as well? Are the long COVID patients also suffering similar signs and symptoms that actually refer to the neurological aspect of the disease? 
So my own estimate is that when I see the signs and symptoms, you will see in the next slides, uh, that uh, actually range to a very high percentage and uh, like 70% of, of, or 65% of the symptoms and the signs seen in patients with long COVID could, could be peculiarly uh, referred to, 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 to the central nervous system. In the next slide, if we could change it, uh, Richard, please, Philip, if we could change it here. Yeah. In the next slide, uh, you see uh, that, that uh, apart from what you saw in the previous slide, that patients having those convulsions and loss of taste and smell, uh, we published the first paper in March 2020 when the disease was in its infancy, noting seizures like in the previous slide you have seen that this virus has got something major to do with the central nervous system. Now, uh, now with 6,000 papers, okay, nobody uh, has got a shred of doubt that whether it's targeting the CNS or not. The question is, how is it carrying that same thing into long COVID patients? Because you start from brain fog, you talk about uh, easy fatigability, the muscle paralysis, the cranial nerve paralysis, the tinnitus. You just like go into the list, okay, of those 103 signs and symptoms, okay, you will find that above 70, 78 of them could be easily referred to particularly the central nervous system. Now, this paper was uh, important from, for us, okay, and it was important from many perspectives because this paper actually mapped the ACE2 receptor expression in different tissues and alerted the uh, peers and the scientific community and health organizations. I personally wrote like over five emails to, to health ministries of different countries which are affected mainly by COVID, okay, and long COVID, that, that, that the vessel system, the endothelium is a major portion of ACE2 uh, expression. So uh, each and every other organ of the body that has got a blood supply would be targeted eventually in, in, in COVID-19 and long COVID. So at that time, I didn't have that prediction. I'm like um, more of a physician than a magician, you know what I mean? That some things would go into long COVID, but I can clearly see now that things are, uh, are ex uh, the, the sign and symptoms expressed by patients in long COVID can be easily referable to that endothelial damage that we even predicted in this paper. Now, <clears throat> apart from uh, above a thousand citations, okay, that it has got in 1.5 years and over a million views, the question is that what did it communicate it to the, to the scientific community? Now, we are seeing even before uh, logging into uh, this Congress, you know, a moment back, I was having a chat uh, that uh, 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 with, with different groups that there is a uh, uh, increase in the finding of acute respiratory failure. Patient forget to, it's like they say, we forgot, we just like don't have the uh, un involuntary control over breathing. We have to breathe ourselves, you know, why is this happening? Now, just imagine that if, if the phrenic now located at C3, C4, C5, that C refers to cervical segment, if actually is damaged, okay, it would not allow the diaphragm to contract and, and allow the spontaneous breathing. So uh, in, in some of the papers, again in 2020, we hinted towards that. And in, in this one, okay, it was very clearly directed that neurological symptoms should be expected. I just wish that's a wish in the caps, you know what I mean? Like that, that uh, the, if we would have appreciated that ahead, okay, we could have saved many CNS complications and even patients going into long COVID. Next slide uh, will show you uh, the long list of that long hauler patients. You know, my heart goes with with them. It, it has got a, uh, I mean, it, it has got a uh, tip to toe type of affection. You can see I put the star on, on the brain and all affecting neurons, but then each and every other organ is equally important. You again see the blood vessel. Now, just imagine that, that if we only start writing these signs and symptoms, okay, which have written in front of them, just it would it would make four A4 pages, you know what I mean? Like like the entire body system, okay? When I say entire, I mean uh, even hair tips and uh, uh, nail beds included. You count every other organ in the midst, okay, is, is getting affected in the syndromic long COVID. So, you know, like there has been a tendency that when you, uh, and our teachers sometime also taught us that when a person comes with a list of signs and symptoms which are exceeding like 30 or 40, okay, try to think over some psychological aspect uh, in, in, in play. I want to make it very clear, okay, in this presentation that 
th this has got nothing to do with something cooking in the head of these patients. How could a person in Japan, Pakistan, US, UK, Sweden, I mean, you name a country, okay, where you don't have a long haul. In Pakistan, the dilemma is that the patient don't have, have, have uh, I mean, like uh, uh, support because the, uh, the patients are not in that large, what you call as group. We don't have a social platform where the voice could be raised, but then the affection is enormous. I, I uh, in the, those 10 minutes that I'm allowed, you know, seven minutes, I cannot sit here and read all of them just like marking towards that star. Okay, just see if, if a spontaneous respiratory failure ensues, you know, the person is done. I mean, like like all the other organs would shut down in no time because the lungs stop breathing if your diaphragm is not functioning. Now, in the next slide uh, that I show you, again, this is very important. If, if you ask me among the slides that I'm presenting today, okay, the most important slide, this would be it, okay. Now, just see that when we call NeuroCOVID and, and NIH is now funding with this name that you see there, NeuroCOVID-19, you know, just see if there is a list of, of, of uh, uh, sign and symptoms. The, just below the A1, the arrow, you, right from the memory loss, okay, you can go to the hearing loss, 15 sign and symptoms. This is, these are the top of the 100, 103 symptoms of long haulers uh, actually suffer. 72 of them can be easily referred to, to, to the central nervous system or a neurological deficit or a damage. So this slide shows you that there can be some time overlap like headache, dizziness, weakness, muscle uh, fatigue, that's on the left-hand side under the B you can see. Headache, dizziness, weakness, muscle weakness, uh, uh, confusion, easy fatigability, dyspnea, apprehension, anxiety. These, these can, can be uh, provoked by other organ diseases as well. But do you get a memory loss, okay, if you have got a problem in the liver and the GIT? Do you uh, start showing a normal gait, that's the way you walk, okay, if you have got a pancreatic pathology or a pathology in the lung? So right from number one, below the A1, till the 15, okay, all of these signs and symptoms have been exhibited and uh, there are published papers on this, which specifically refer towards neurological features. You will ask this question most possibly, but let me like give you some clues that this differential diagnosis, okay, is, is very much possible using the modalities that you see at the bottom in diagram D, E, and the most important F, okay, clinical examination. The distinction can be can be uh, made, uh, uh, I would not say easily, but it, it's not an impossible task to achieve. So you can segregate the neurological signs and symptoms into the ones which can be caused by generalized hypoxia, muscle injury, or, 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 or damages to other organs, and you can segregate them into the ones okay, which can be peculiarly caused by damage to the central nervous system. So to all of those guys listening here, if, you're, if your physician or your, your GP okay, says that it may be psychological, okay, if you have got any of them uh, uh, with you from number one till number 15 here, just please say that, okay, can I have this as a psychological problem? I mean, tell me how many people lose their uh, ability to hear and suffer hearing loss because of hearing loss because of, of psychological problem. Movement disorder, anosmia, cranial nerve deficits, the number six is the most prominent one. They teach it us in the medical school from, from day one, okay, that if these nerves get damaged, okay, how the body would look like, where to find that. Pick the, the, uh, again, this uh, other word, okay, is specifically referable to the central nervous system. So those who were in doubt, okay, earlier in the course of the disease that uh, COVID-19 is like uh, uh, affecting the lungs, it's a respiratory disease, okay, yeah, it starts from the lung, okay, but then see where it goes from the tip to the toe. You saw the previous slide. Next slide will show you, please. Oh, I, I think what we'll do, Manan, is that we've just about run out of the time. When no we problem. get to to your to the panel, we may be able to show that last slide that you have. Is no that problem. okay? No problem. Right. No, uh, that's fine with me. I, okay. I, I hope I, I conveyed the message. Okay, which for absolutely. And 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 this slide was the most important one. So. If I could talk on this one, okay, uh, I'm very happy with that. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. And so what we will do, thank you very much, Marlon. And what we will do now is that the first thing that we will do in our next phase, and just to, to keep you all um, aware, we're trying our best to stay on schedule at the moment. Um, I think we are about on time. 
And um, so what we're going to be having next is in our spotlight too, is a jazz manager is going to be sharing his thoughts. Then we're going to introduce the panel again, and then we're going to speak to each speaker in turn. And that's where if there are other points that need to be raised, um, they can come up. If you have a question at that point, if we have the opportunity to share it, that would be the time to add it in. So uh, let's get straight into our first spotlight. And Jez, if you can unmute, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your experience regarding long COVID. Um, so I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit from the patient perspective of treatments and as patients, how we go about getting help from the medical community. And like, I will talk mostly with a UK focus because I haven't experienced so much of what it's like abroad. Um, but I know that people struggle wherever they are in the world getting help from the existing sort of medical community uh, for long COVID. And I think you know, in the UK, if you're lucky enough for your GP to refer you in, and you're in an area where there are long COVID clinics, uh, you might eventually, after a period of time, get into a long COVID clinic. Um, but even some of these long COVID clinics are now being shut down and sort of mothballed in the UK as well. So, so even those are going away. But let's say you get in, then you have um, what might happen is you'll see a number of different specialists, a respiratory specialist, maybe a neurologist, maybe a cardiovascular specialist. And each one of them will look at your symptoms and then try and work out how those symptoms might fit the pre-existing templates for the conditions that they normally treat. And they might offer you some medication that, you know, might help some of those conditions. But they're sort of trying to fit a sort of a, round, a square peg into a round hole really here, because... Part of the problem with sort of Western medicine as we know it is that, you know, it's evidence-based medicine. And with a new condition, we simply haven't had the time yet to gather the evidence <laughs> for evidence-based medicine to practice. And what that means is that there's very little uh, evidence out there for doctors to be able to prescribe things that out there in the community, patients are trying and saying, this really works and this really helps. Um, and we need to wait for the research to sort of catch up with what the patients are trying themselves um, so that the doctors have that evidence base to work off. But the problem is, is that that research takes a really, really long time. And one of the problems in the UK as well is that there doesn't seem to be a particularly good strategic way of looking at how to sort of fill in the jigsaw puzzle of what's going on with long COVID. Let's imagine that we've got a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and we've maybe got 100 or 150 of the pieces on the table vaguely in the right sort of place. In a perfect world, we'd have uh, an organization, the NIHR, looking at the jigsaw puzzle and saying, um, okay, here are the gaps in this corner and this side and the rest of it. This is where we need to fill in. This is what we know already. Let's put, you know, let's fund some projects that help fill in those gaps. And maybe we could even look across at other jigsaw puzzles, which are partially completed, like ones for fibromyalgia or ME-CFS or other chronic illness, where they might have that corner filled in. And that's the corner we need to fill in. Maybe we can look at <laughs> what we know already from that and build on that with a research project that's designed to build on the knowledge we have. And I, that's why I was really reassured, actually, because I hadn't I wasn't aware of what the uh, government accountability office in the US was doing, which is what Rezia brought up. And it seems like in America, they're actually looking at some of the key places that we need to be looking at. So viral persistence, you know, <laughs> clotting pathologies um, and persistent virus, you know, microclots, organ damage, autoimmunity. So it looks like they've got a slightly better handle there on targeting the research where we need it. But this is one of the really frustrating things and where I think a conference like this is so important, because it's often said that, you know, when you've got a new condition, the breakthroughs come not from the center of the establishment, but from the fringes. And it's from the sort of the people who are actually able to look a little bit sideways or to look into those connective spaces between the silos of knowledge that we have between each specialty. And that's where we'll find the answer for long COVID, I think, because it is this multi-organ, multi-system condition. And I think it's in those gaps where the answer is going to live. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Jez. And uh, what we'll do is uh, bring in our our panelists first. And what I'll do is before we bring in uh, Rezia, uh, if you don't mind, just a few quick thoughts from, from you all as to what you've heard. We're going to bring in each speaker and you can ask them a question. 
what 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 are what are your general feelings, um, Giancaro and, and Valentina? Just well, I don't know who's gonna start. I will jump first if if Shankara allows. Uh, I think we under this platform we brought top experts who seriously uh, work in the right direction, helping to understand the syndrome and uh, working different pathways. I will be having three questions to our speakers today to dig deeper a little bit into their findings and especially with your Hume solution as well, which, it, which basically is sounds very promising and um, there is definitely huge potential in this solution looking into the results that were presented. Uh, another thing, uh, as Gaz also mentioned, um, long COVID is a new disease and we need to look from different perspectives. It is not something that we can rely on looking, taking back uh, the previous uh, diseases and uh, we can't take existing medicines and apply it blindly. We need trials, yes, it takes time. We need research, yes, it takes time, but I think with uh, social media now, we are in a position to do this research as guests does some research and uh, we also looking into how we collaboratively can gather most common symptoms. How can we find the answers to the puzzle of long COVID? And we produce actually speedy results rather than waiting for uh, NHS or any other healthcare system providers and policymakers to, to produce these protocols because we are first line uh, supporters here and we jump on these uh, solutions and up-to-date research and we try to understand it and spread uh, the research among the specialists because we all learn and we also want to know the best solutions that will tackle the disease from multiple perspectives and I think we do the right job now. Excellent, excellent. A uh, quick thought from you, Shankara, before I bring in Rezia. And just to say, what we'll ask is everybody just ask one question as we'll try and keep the time relatively tight. But a quick thought from you, Shankara, before we bring in Rezia. Yeah, I think, I think uh, absolutely pertinent comments by the other two panelists. Uh, Philip, we're dealing with a condition where it affects various different systems and those spiral in different directions out of control. So everything seems to influence each other. So the diversity of this presenting symptoms in, in long COVID is mind boggling. And so we need all the information we can to try and figure out the different markers that we need, the different systems influence and the different treatments that will be uh, appropriate in different patients because of the diversity of presentation. So I hope we get some good understanding tonight. Excellent. So um, we'll bring in Rezia here and um, I'll let the, the panelists uh, go ahead and ask you their question. Uh, anybody wants to go first? I'll dive in. Um, yeah. Hi there, Rezia. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask you if there was anything that you can share uh, with us or at least just discuss what's going on with the uh, most recent research project you're doing uh, where the research was conducted in Mulheim around help apheresis. Is there anything you can tell us about that and what, uh, what the purpose of that project is? Yes, thank you. Uh, so as, as is mentioned, we traveled to I'm in Germany to a clinic from that belongs to, to Dr. Beate Jäger. Uh, she uses health apheresis to treat patients with long COVID. Uh, and we were a whole group of researchers from all over the globe that joined forces here to analyze the data. Currently, the data of 19 patients are being written up. The paper is actually completed. However, we still need to do just a few checks and balances with um, regards to data sharing and what we are allowed to share. And remember, it's, it's Europe versus South Africa and they signed my ethics so we just need to, to, to figure out that we everything is done in, in accordance but what 
I can tell you is that the results are extremely positive. So Dr. Yeager has treated patients with helpapheresis and she also uses a combination of triple therapy which she calms down the patient's uh, platelets and prevents clot, new clot formation. Uh, and she's got really good results. So I hope that in future, we will be able to have clinical trials that not only trial help apheresis in a randomized control trial, but also to look into the treatment regimes of triple therapy for something like uh, calming the, the platelets uh, to prevent microclot from forming and eventually to calm down the endothelial layers because we think central to all the disease uh, pathologies and all of the persistent symptoms is a constant endothelitis resulting then also in a significant and widespread a hypoxia. So, so there's, um, yes, the, the study is has been written up, we've done the analysis, we will share the preprint within the next few weeks. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and Valentino or Giancarlo? Uh, yes, I would like to have a follow-up on this. Thank you. For me, to, it was it's nice to meet you here again, and uh, people may be aware that we are recording interviews with Professor Pretorius, and uh, we're very happy to share your findings with the larger community and learn more from you. So uh, with regards to the help of racist and triple coagulation therapy that you just discussed, so is there a chance for these clots to form again? And if you say it's uh, somehow this therapy prevents clotting formation, how, how sure you are about this? And uh, if the clot might form again, what could be the triggers? And the last one, actually, uh, do do we roughly know uh, how quickly microclots can form? All of the questions that you're asking are very, very relevant and most important to answer. So um, in South Africa, I've been working with a clinical team uh, uh, amongst others from the Medi-Clinic and Dr. Jakulopsia, who has been treating patients with triple therapy. Uh, obviously, it's not been trialed, it's best clinical practice. What we have been finding is if the, if the patients get to him within three to six months after they have developed and been suffering from long COVID, uh, the microclots seem to, to be able to be treated uh, quite easily and the symptoms most of the symptoms will disappear uh, and i must just stand still here for a second what we have been finding was that in acute COVID, there are uh, uh, clots that have been forming if the clots do not get resolved during the acute phase then there's the persistent lingering of the clots so if one catches the clots and uh, in the serial damage happen, what that's happened and platelet hyperactivation is quite early in the disease of long COVID progression. Then it is resolved that the endothelial cells and, and layers um, will, will heal and the patients will return to health. The issue is if we leave the patients for six months, eight months, 24 months, then something else comes into play. Viral persistence can be a very important factor, but the most important factor that can happen is autoantibodies, possibly against the trapped inflammatory molecules that is inside the microclots. And that is a real problem because then we sit with all sorts of damage from autoantibodies, antiphospholipid syndrome, all of those things coming into play. And the important thing is with a constant long-term uh, presence of microclots with of oxygen deprivation of all of the body, um, uh, the brain, the muscles, some of the organ systems, I'm afraid that there might be long-term damage happening due to hypoxia. So that is why there's such an urgent need to move fast to find proper treatment regimes that we can uh, look into treating patients much earlier. Okay. Uh, did, do we have time for a quick question from Shankara? And, or, go ahead. Okay. A, a quick one, Philip. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, just uh, s s something to clarify. Uh, you noted that the microclots formed during this, this long COVID process was very different from others that you experienced in that they're not digested by trypsin. Uh, they seem to be uh, undigestible. And this points to the underlying mechanism of the clot formation. But some of them get dissolved. And this might be 
pointing to what happens in acute COVID that actually leads to these microclot formations and makes them undigestible in the long COVID situation. Uh, does this identification of this uh, unusual kind of clot uh, point to a mechanism that can uh, elucidate what's going on in acute COVID and modify acute COVID treatment so that we can actually prevent the progression to these undigestible clots? Absolutely, uh, Shankara. That is that is what the the underlying issue is. I think um, what was in, in also important to note is that my clinical collaborator Yaku Lobsha has been treating patients in the acute phase with triple therapy with great success. And uh, interestingly, uh, his patients do not progress to long COVID. So it's it's something to 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 look into and to understand clearly what happens in the forty, the ten to thirty to forty that percent that Valentina mentioned that do not, uh, percent of people that do not um, recover. Is there something perhaps in, in their genetics? Is there predisposition? Uh, is what, what causes these molecules to form and being trapped inside the clots? Uh, the alpha-2 antiplasm and many, many other molecules still need to be discovered uh, inside the clots because we, you know, we just had a spotlight and uh, a shot into what are the molecules trapped in, in these, uh, these clots. Uh, so I think the most important thing to now, you know, is a research, understanding clot and physiology from acute COVID right through to long COVID and uh, much, much more viral persistence, uh, autoantibodies, all of those things might play a significant role, perhaps pre-COVID, before the patient has developed, uh, uh, you know, COVID. What are the, the all the, the uh, comorbidities and the interactions leading to some of these patients not uh, recovering fully? The answer must be uh, somewhere between the people that has recovered to look into what is different in their physiology versus the ones that are uh, suffering from these long, long-term symptoms. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rezia. And we'll be able to explore some of that um, in a little bit more detail uh, a little bit later on. So moving straight along, we've brought in um, to us Joachim uh, to answer any questions, a few questions from each panelist. Um, anybody wants to go first here? Maybe Shankara, if you want to go first this time. Uh, welcome, welcome, Joachim. Uh, a few Thank questions. You. Uh, you've noted in your presentation that the uh, nutraceutical combinations tend to enhance the uh, speed to recovery from the uh, allopathic or the, 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 the usual way of doing things. Uh, and you've noted some significant uh, improvements there. Would you say that that is simply because you have managed to dovetail uh, your, your nutraceutical choices to the uh, underlying pathophysiology of COVID illness? And uh, some of it is uh, due to the refinement of your products, making them more bioavailable, seeing that nutraceuticals, that seems to be the biggest stumbling block in their speed to recovery with patients. Yes, uh, to the first question, of course, uh, the, um, the initial selection of these molecules out of the 8,000 available um, was done uh, to very precise uh, procedures. Um, I, I can't show that right now, but maybe later we can uh, uh, show that these drug target pathway lists. That means we took all the known drug target pathways and all the known disbalances, be it enzymes, be it host cell receptors, be it uh, information, endothelial information, for example, or uh, uh, neuropathological um, pathways. And look, what the, where do these molecules come in? Then, of course, the combination of them. There is like a lot of synergies between these um, molecules so they're together they're working better than alone and then uh, working towards the goal uh, we were even surprised how, how good we could then really enhance the bioavailability in formulation development and so it, these molecules are working different than pharmaceutical drugs what they really enable the body is to use these molecules that nature has been using for millions of years and our organism kind of uses them in a we don't understand yet which kind of signaling system between the cells and the molecules to bring things back to balance so it's not like a pharmaceutical intervention that will go one direction and if you keep dosing it it, it will bring it uh, even into a let's say to a state where it's a little bit too much so th th these molecules tend to just rebalance things and help the organism to eat itself 
I mean, we can heal ourselves given the right circumstances. And so these, uh, yeah, that I hope that it answers your question. Yeah. Any any questions from Jez? Uh, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Um, so um, I was wondering, like, I noticed in the presentation you had Vedicinals 9, which is one of your projects, um, how many uh, products do you have? And do you target them at particular symptoms groups in long COVID? Um, and which symptoms are they particularly effective at dealing with? Yes. So uh, the first question is, we only have one product currently in India, which is Vedicinals 9. And this is a pretty broadband comprehensive protocol already by itself then we are recommending not selling a lot of other uh, useful supplements that have shown in the literature and in outcomes and especially patient reports to be pretty beneficial. Uh, some also don't work so well with medicinals, for example, like niacin, flushing niacin cannot be combined. So we are constantly refining, learning and adding or sometimes even taking away uh, some molecules that can be added and especially then for certain purposes. Yeah, so if you have an um, over expression of a certain symptom, then it might make sense to add even omega-3 or sulforaphane or other dietary to these molecules because we uh, can constantly researching. So the, the main uh, success reports we get on patients at the moment is shortness of breath, um, fatigue, and um, yeah, like I said, hypoxia and general well-being. I mean, it sounds pretty unscientific, but we get now daily the message you gave me, my, you gave me my life back. And it doesn't mean that everybody will recover fully, and that uh, there will also be uh, people using these nutraceuticals without having these strong effects. But um, it is another tool now in the toolbox. We think that is going to come in helpful and um, bring back the general condition to a point where people really improve and very quickly. And Valentina, any question? Yes, absolutely. First of all, yeah, I'm impressed by the level of scientific scrutiny you put into the medicinal slime. I wish we would see something like this from, from, uh, from for example, pharmaceutical solutions. I know it's a joke. I know uh, that you started shipment from uh, India to Europe and US. And I can tell that among our community members, we see incredibly positive feedback with the solution itself and service that you provide. And I would like just to say thank you for helping those who suffer. Uh, however, just very short note, having this opportunity to ask questions I can't resist not to ask. Uh, what is your opinion about medicinals in terms of short versus long-term use of it? And if it's long-term use, would it require lower dose and taking less frequently? Do you know anything? I wish I would be able to answer that question completely. You know that we are still learning, researching, that we are observing, that we are having uh, now initiated some trials. So the short and long term, uh, we uh, at the at this stage we have patients or uh, clients that buy this nutraceutical and take. It's a fourteen day course, so it's fourteen bottles, and that is one course. And so most are finishing two course consecutive, which also is uh, coinciding with our safety data. And then they do do a break of a week, and then they go a third course if necessary. I think it is uh, the best way to go would be to use a panel of biomarkers before starting an intervention and then maybe after 28 days at the latest do another uh, uh, check of, of the panels and see what has improved. Also you observing your own symptoms. If you, um, if you can start moving around more um, and, and you, uh, you take medicines night at the same time and you, you, you don't, cannot um, observe any of these strong conditions and symptoms don't overdo it we have to stop people now from jumping around too much because they're so happy to have their life back and we kind of tell them look take it a little bit easy that is a very fast uh, step forward you did now so don't don't overdo it so i think that even even though it's a nutraceutical intervention and people can kind of uh, get it and take it themselves uh, i still recommend strongly 
to keep that under observation with biomarkers, which you and I and other people in the foundation and in your network are working on right now, so that we get good results and then we can decide, or the patient and the doctor can decide when to stop it or keep on taking it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joachim. And uh, moving straight along, um, we have the opportunity to have a quick chat with uh, Manon. And um, since you went last the last time, Valentina, you probably can go first this time. Okay, thank you. So um, I have to say we had an interview with Dr. Bake previously under our foundation and uh, Dr. Bake provided lots of information on how brain can be damaged post-COVID infection. What are the symptoms that may explain the neurological damage which is present? So today I would love to ask your advice on most appropriate diagnostics that people can ask for and which would guide neurologists who don't specialize in long COVID to the right direction. So remember, we always are interested in the right tests, not common ones that are often mm -hmm. offered and which always come as normal. And uh, another maybe question you could um, cover is, what is the role of vagus nerve dysfunction and what role it may play in some features of long COVID? And, um, vagus nerve stimulation as a solution to reduce inflammation is it a good way forward so coming to your first question you know uh, specific diagnostic tools okay to uh, diagnose neurological uh, damages and uh, neurological deficits the thing is uh, i want i wrote a paper last night okay it got submitted as well but then there, these are few lines from it and i want to make it very clear okay to all the listeners okay who are who have joined us that a biochemical injury means when the virus of the immune system is damaging a neuron okay and the neuron is trying to compensate from from the injurious agent or the injurious circumstances forget about it that you would get any finding on imaging like cat scan pet scan or ct scan so uh, like the paper last week in the nature the biobank okay showing the images okay of patient with covid okay affecting the brain that doesn't happen in uh, initially when the biochemical uh, the damages are going at biochemical level so it's always the the trust that if uh, 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 remember uh, this thing very clearly symptoms never lie i mean if a person is telling you that he or she is having hearing loss hearing voices like tinnitus or, or or buzzings and stuff they need to be investigated but the question is do we have the tools that can diagnose a biochemical injury the answer is no. So the question is, what do we have? So when you injure certain cells, okay, they release certain chemicals into the milieu like CSF. Uh, if they cross the uh, to the venous system, they might be detected in the blood. So we have to keep our eyes on on the prize. You know, biomarkers first, imaging number two, because by the time you see it on imaging, enough damage has already been done. So this was the question one. Question two. Vagus nerve. Now, this is a nerve, okay, which is very interesting. It's one of the longest cranial nerve that I know, okay, after the sciatic in, 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 in the thigh. The, this nerve starts from the base of the skull and the last organ it innervates is the pelvis of the kidney. Now, this long course, it can uh, get damaged like other nerves are getting damaged, okay, no surprises with that. But the question that if vagus nerve stimulation could help, I'll tell you, uh, I've got few uh, uh, reservations on that because vagus nerve, is, if it's stimulated, carries efferent uh, nerve fibers to the brain, and it stimulates uh, the, the dorsal vagal gang, uh, nucleus okay, in the in the brainstem. It can spontaneously stop the heartbeat. Okay, so those who are ex uh, actually experimenting it, my advice is that do it under clinical observation, under the supervision of a doctor or a trained physician or a neurophysiologist or neurotherapist. You know don't attempt it by yourself okay because i know my medical books say that even pricking the ear okay some place where the vagus nerve supplies can cause a heart uh, uh, to stand still i hope i answered your question all right and jess um I'll, I'll let you go ahead with your question um yeah i mean how do we it's a simple one and maybe not a simple one how do we go about treating people who've got <laughs> neurological damage what what options are there what do we do see uh, uh, we, we, we actually call this uh, term by uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, approach by a term which we 
to say, uh, call as neuroprotection. So there are some neuroprotective drugs, okay, and, and several papers on them, not on COVID, okay, but for other uh, similar injuries, which the neurons suffer. So if you are actually supplementing the neurons at the time when they are getting damaged biochemically, when I say biochemically, I mean like you are not getting anything on the image, we may offer some help to, to, to those, those patients, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shankara, any any question on this? Uh, uh, Dr. Baig, from the from a clinical perspective of uh, treating patients with neuro neuropathies, with Omicron we saw a lot of uh, patients presenting with uh, neurologic uh, symptoms, and uh, I think with Omicron we're going to get a lot more long COVID, simply because the presentation of long COVID is very mild, so people tend to ignore it, unlike in the first three waves where the second presentation was pretty critical and it got patients into hospital and health care. Here we're getting patients presenting with fatigue, some neurologic nonspecific symptoms that tend not to be attributed to any COVID uh, pathology. But I've noticed in my practice that a lot of it is related to COVID. Uh, from the perspective of allaying symptoms rather than repairing damage, have you found uh, the addition of any medications that actually help in these, in these symptoms? I've noticed a lot of strange neurologic pain. And of course, there's a whole subset of different medications to treat neurologic pain. Have you found any benefit using those in, in, these, in these patients? Uh, now, this is a very vital question because it, is, it touches the root of, of the COVID uh, symptomatology. Uh, see, uh, I will be very candid and honest in, in answering this question. Long COVID is, a, is very much in its infancy. Okay, the knowledge we are gathering, okay, what type of damages the neurons suffer, we then would be able to actually address what specific drugs could do. But uh, like Jez asked the question, okay, I said neuroprotective agents, okay, neuroprotective molecules like Joshim is working on and stuff, these should all shake hand, okay, before we start uh, treating these patients after having the clinical trials. Because before the clinical trials, okay, anything which we say, okay, is, is early. On, and uh, I want to finish it on this note that uh, because you started with Omicron that we are seeing that we are seeing more uh, Dr. Shankar, okay, to be honest, okay, be it Delta, Alpha, Beta or, or Omicron, uh, it's, it's uh, affection to the, the central nervous system would depend upon one most important factor that's viral load in the nose or the throat or wherever it is. In the nose, very peculiarly, it has got a root through cribriform plate to go to the brain. So my thing is that be it Omicron, B1, B2, or, or Delta, if the viral load is very high in the nose, okay, its chances to ascend to the brain uh, gets higher. So if it comes in the blood, that's another story. But then uh, the viral load is the mother of, of, uh, of affection of every other organ, including the central nervous system, because the excess is a bypass uh, of the blood brain barrier. From here, okay, you don't need to cross that barrier. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll have a chance to discuss some of these other points um, a little bit later. And so just to keep everyone on track at the moment. So here we have finished our first panel discussion. And what we'll be doing now is having presentation um, four and six. We sadly don't have um, Professor Mary Honig with us uh, today. But um, what we'll do is we'll continue along and we'll, and we'll be next having Dr. Tina Pears. 